I want to thank everyone for joining us today for our committee's hybrid hearing. I want to make sure to note some important requirements. Let me begin by saying that standing House and committee rules and practice will continue to apply during hybrid proceedings. All members are reminded that they are expected to, he to adhere to these standing rules, including decorum. With that said, the technology we are utilizing today requires us to make some small modifications to ensure that members can fully participate in these proceedings. During the covered period as designated by the Speaker, the Committee will operate in accordance with House Resolution 965 and the subsequent guidance from the Rules Committee in a manner that respects the rights of all members to participate. House regulations require members to be visible through a video connection throughout the proceeding, so please keep your cameras on. Also, if you have to participate in another proceeding, please exit this one and log back in later. In the event a member encounters t technical issues that prevent them from being recognized for their questioning, I will move to the next available member of the same party, and I will recognize that, that member at the next appropriate time slot, provided they have returned to the proceeding. Should a member's time be interrupted by technical issues, I will recognize that member at the next appropriate spot for the remainder of their time once their issue has been resolved. In the event a witness loses connectivity during the testimony or questioning, I will preserve their time as staff address the technical issue. I may need to recess the proceedings to provide time for the witness to reconnect. And finally, remember to remain muted until you are recognized to minimize background noise. In accordance with the rules established under House Resolution 965, staff has been advised to mute participants only in the event there is an inadvertent background noise. Should a member wish to be recognized, they must unmute themselves and seek recognition at the appropriate time. For those members here in the room today, we will also be following the health and safety guidelines issued by the attending physician. That includes social distancing and especially the use of masks. I urge members and staff to wear masks at all times while in the hearing room, and I thank you in advance for your commitment to the safety uh, to a safe environment for all of us here today. Again, good morning and thank you all for being here. I'd especially like to thank the witnesses for taking time out of their busy schedule to be with us this morning. I want to also thank the Small Business Committee staff for their extremely diligent work during this unique time. It's no secret that small businesses are reeling from the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, which brought entire sectors of the U.S. economy to a standstill. Unemployment is at its highest level since the 1930s. Many businesses have been forced to shut their doors to comply with stay-at-home orders. Businesses and essential services that have been able to remain open face shortages for high-demand products, higher costs for, for production materials, and an inability to get finished goods to market. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed many weaknesses in our supply chains, both global and domestic, affecting virtually every industry. Most notably, we have seen hospitals, states, and local governments scramble to ensure the integrity and continued flow of desperately needed personal protective equipment, PPE, and medical devices such as ventilators. Too many times, our communities, healthcare systems, and businesses were competing with each other, bidding up prices and creating supply dislocations across the country. As well, severe COVID outbreaks at food processing facilities meant consumers also experienced the heavy costs of the pandemic on our food supply chain. Small firms can be particularly vulnerable to disruption in supply chains. Many spent years refining just-in-time supply systems, maintaining only a few days or a few weeks of in inventory. Many others have limited control of their supply chain and depend on lower-priced suppliers from overseas to support razor-thin margins here at home. An over-reliance on foreign countries for manufacturing components was already an issue before the pandemic hit. As the health crisis spread, Americans realized that too much of our medical supply and personal protective equipment sourcing was in China and other countries hit by COVID. As these countries nationalized their manufacturing capacities, shipments to the United States started to dry up. Initially, the crisis was, was with PPE, then other finished products, but quickly moved to raw materials and components U.S. manufacturers depend, depend upon to produce their goods for market. These supply disruptions affected businesses large and small in every state. However, as they so often do, American small business across a variety of industries have, in, have demonstrated incredible resiliency, resourcefulness, and ingenious flexibil flexibility, shifting product lines, moving to more e-commerce, and utilizing alternative supplies and modified distribution chains. Some shifted to making PPE and hand sanitizer in a matter of days. Others came up with new and innovative ways to source their products, while others still discovered new delivery channels and entirely new markets. We will hear inspiring stories of this adaptability today. So why are we here? 
Small businesses are the heart and soul of our local communities. They represent more than 40% of our national GDP and more than half our country's jobs. Today's hearing will focus on how we can help sustain our nation's small businesses and explore potential solutions to establish more resilient supply chains through this crisis and into the future. Improving our nation's supply chain resiliency will require an all-hands-on-deck approach as both domestic and global supply chains are vastly interconnected yet can vary significantly from industry to industry, product to product. We must also recognize that trade is an essential part of supporting small business in a, sm in a modern economy. 95% of the world's population reside outside the United States, and exporting provides small businesses with literally billions of new customers. However, it is important that we prioritize making things here at home to protect our national security and public health. Doing so will also create jobs and ultimately help us build a stronger economy and a better future for all of us. Second, to enhance our economy's resiliency, we can do better utilizing the distinct, strength, the distinct strengths and greater adaptability of small companies. In many ways, smaller firms are more nimble than larger ones and can quickly shift their manufacturing, distribution, and sales capacities to meet increased demands for certain goods. Third, much of the disruptions we are experiencing currently were both predictable and preventable. We need to establish better lines of communication and develop better coordination so that we can anticipate shortages, identify additional and alternative sources, and get critical goods and products where they are needed in the most timely, efficient, and cost-effective way. And finally, we need to help small companies be able to diversify, reinforce, and scale their supply chains to better deal with unforeseen surges. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses today about their experiences and their ideas for charting a path so we avoid future crises. Hopefully this hearing can help us establish best practices for our small firms and some principles for our federal government as the economy recovers. Thank you to everyone for being here today. I now recognize the ranking member, Mr. Hearn, for his opening statement. Mr. Hearn, I think you may still be on mute. Yeah, we had. Uh, thank you. Now, issue now we had with uh, our tech, tech. All right, thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, thank my colleague for sitting in the chair today and leading our committee. And uh, you know, this there's no question that this uh, Black Swan event has sent a shockwave through the world and forcing supply chain leaders to rethink current operating models, questioning their organization's emergency preparedness and dependencies on primary sources. Industries of all kinds, from medical to agricultural to automotive, retail and manufacturing, and more have been discriminately harmed by cascading effects of the novel coronavirus. In the medical industry, the pandemic created an international shortage of personal protection equipment necessary to protect healthcare workers and heal patients. The flow of life-saving pharmaceuticals in the United States has also choked and disrupted in the supply chains across the nation. However, small businesses were able to quickly fill the gaps in supply chain, pivoting from their operations to quickly produce critical medical supplies, potentially saving countless lives. COVID-19 also rattled the agricultural food service industry, disrupting all parts of supply chain from farmers to processing plants to distributors with significant uncertainty still on the horizon. However, many farmers are rising to the challenges of the moment, adapting to the way Americans now shop and eat by experimenting with direct customer sales and deliveries. Additionally, the President's Executive Order 13917 takes one step towards keeping food supply chains intact. In the manufacturing sector, businesses face several logistical hurdles trying to regulate their accounts payable and receivables, having to reassess market demand and adjust output. Tremendous hurdles exist in trying to manage the workforce, move inventory from one place to another, and keep customer relationships intact during the trying times. As we've seen in a number of other industries, small and local businesses have stepped into the breach, filling the void where traditional suppliers and distributors held. Unfortunately, for every small business success story comes out of this pandemic, we also see mom and pop shops shutting down. Long and unemployment lines country and other small businesses are in any way vulnerable to the rippling effects of the coronavirus. Where a big company might have a contingency plan and a larger network built into their supply chain, 
Many small businesses operate on a more linear path, leaving them at a greater risk when disruptions occur. Even though the overall picture may seem bleak, the silver lining is this power or to reshape the supply chain just are considered. For time, adapt, companies look at diversity, may consider developing relationships with the local and small businesses to fit in anywhere along their supply chain. My hope today is that we can learn more about what we can do to help small businesses affected by the COVID-19 outbreak and how we can leverage the, small, the power of small businesses to fortify our national supply chain. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. I'd now like to take a moment to explain how this hearing will proceed. Each witness will have five minutes to provide a statement, and each committee member will have five minutes for questions. Please ensure that your microphone is on when you begin speaking, and then that you return to mute when you are finished. With that, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Eswar Prasad. Dr. Prasad is the Talani Senior Professor of Trade Policy at Cornell University. He is also a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. He was pre previously Chief of the Financial Studies Division in the International Monetary Fund's Research Department, and before that, he was head of the IMF's China Division. Thank you, Dr. Prasad, for being here today. Our second witness is Christine Fagnani. Ms. Fagnani is the co-owner and acting vice president of sales and marketing for Lynn Medical. She has held this position for the past 18 years. Prior to working at Lynn Medical, Christine worked for Johnson & Johnson for 16 years in their pharmaceutical division. Christine is also active with the Health Industry and Distribution Association, the leading trade association representing medical distributors. Thank you, Ms. Fagnani, for, uh, for being here as well. Our third witness is David Bilstrom. Mr. Bilstrom leaves Kitzbow Consulting Apparel in Old Fort, North Carolina. Along a 39-year career that includes Intel Corporation and Walt Disney, he founded an internet search engine company, helped build the Clover Coffee Company acquired by Starbucks, and two years ago became the leader of Kitzbow, a cycling apparel company that recently moved from California to North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Bilstrom, for being here today as well. I now would like to yield to our, our ranking member, Mr. Hearn, to introduce our final witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to welcome our final witness, who is from my district, Ms. Sheila Lawson. Good morning, Sheila. Uh, Ms. Lawson is the Chief Operations Officer for R.L. Hudson & Company, located in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. R.L. Hudson & Company was founded in 1980, and founder Rick Hudson was at the tip of the spear, recognizing the coming trend of Asian manufacturing, where he began establishing relationships abroad. Soon, the small company that started out as a distributor of rubber O-ring sales became a booming success story with the capability to research, design, and test unique and patentable rubber compounds. In 2017, the company launched a new in-house capability and continues to expand its succeeding competitive industrial landscape. Ms. Lawson brings her with her a deep well of experience, having lived in the supply chain and operations world for 30 years. She has been with R.L. Hudson for the past 14 years, serving as COO for the past two. She is currently in her third term as president of the Association for Operations Management, previously known as the American Production and Inventory Control Society, where she has also been on the board of directors since 2004. Ms. Lawson is a thoughtful and intelligent leader, continuously striving to stay informed as the landscape in her profession evolves. Thank you for your participation today. I look forward to hearing your testimony. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hearn. Um, we'll now recognize our witnesses. Dr. Prasad, you're recognized for five minutes. Small businesses are indeed the bulwark of the American economy. And in this very trying time when the COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged the entire American economy, small businesses have taken the brunt um, of the burden. They have smaller cash buffers and smaller other sorts of buffers to deal with the shock of this sort. But a far less recognized factor that is affecting small businesses is, of course, the disruption of supply chains. So I commend the committee uh, for holding this hearing and thank you, uh, Chairman Kim and uh, Ranking Member Hearn, uh, for allowing me to share my views uh, with a focus especially on global supply chains, which many of my um, distinguished fellow panelists uh, will also be speaking about. Now, global supply chains have been a boon for small businesses in many ways. One of the reasons these supply chains have proliferated is that, thanks largely to U.S. leadership over many decades, uh, both tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade have fallen around the world, 
and transportation costs have declined. Small businesses have taken full advantage of these uh, supply chain possibilities around the world, and this has allowed them to reduce costs, increase efficiencies, and even expand into broader uh, aspects of business that they might not have been able to do in other circumstances. Because um, for small businesses, the option of vertical integration, that is basically trying to integrate all parts of a production process within one firm is not really a viable option. Um, so I think the vitality of small businesses in the US does owe its in part to the integration of supply chains. Now supply chains are uh, subject to disruption for a variety of reasons. One reason of course is um, health and natural disasters such as the COVID-19 pandemic that we're experiencing right now. But there are other factors as well. Um, trade uh, relationships are very important in terms of maintaining the viability of these supply chains and trade tensions among the major economies, for instance, the US-China trade relationship or even um, the North American trade relationships, which are both very important for small business supply chains, have certainly had their fair share of tensions um, in recent years. Um, geopolitical tensions in other parts of the world um, and weaknesses in other countries, which are very important export markets for small businesses, in addition to being part of supply chains, also uh, create vulnerabilities. So what can small businesses do to increase the resiliency of their supply chains? One potential strategy, of course, is onshoring. That certainly reduces uh, by, uh, vulnerability to global supply chains, but it also takes away many of the advantages of global supply chains that um, small businesses have benefited from. So it's not clear that that is the optimal strategy. Another possible strategy is diversification. That is not relying just on one uh, source of suppliers, but trying to diversify across countries, across suppliers. Now this has both advantages and costs. Certainly having a more diversified uh, supply chain is going to create more resiliency, more redundancy, but it comes um, at a cost, especially in terms of efficiency. And for small businesses, um, cost is clearly a very important uh, consideration. Small businesses can, of course, also increase um, the resiliency of the supply chains through using technology that can improve their logistics and other parts of their management. So there are many strategies that small businesses can employ, but government has a crucial role to play as well. So what can the government do? In the short term, it's very clear. Small businesses are hurting, as we will hear from my uh, fellow panelists, and the sort of assistance the government has provided so far, um, both to the Treasury's Paycheck Protection Program um, and also uh, the Main Street Lending Program of the Federal Reserve, have been very important. And it's crucial that this assistance be continued, and more importantly, that congressional oversight, including by your committee, make sure that this assistance does reach uh, these firms and uh, reaches them in a timely manner. In addition, the government can also play a useful role in terms of um, tamping down the uncertainty that is created by uh, trade tensions around the world. Certainly, there is a case to be made that effective negotiations by the US um, would help to level the playing field that would help small businesses, but uncertainty in trading relationships and trade frictions certainly don't help. Um, providing more assistance through the Export-Import Bank for exporting firms can certainly help as well. And um, America's support for the multinational institutions, um, such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, which in turn can help other countries that are export markets of the U.S., is a crucial factor as well. So between uh, small businesses themselves and the government, I think uh, this very difficult patch can be gone through, and it is my hope that working together governments, um, uh, the, the federal government, local governments, and small businesses themselves can maintain the resiliency that they have shown in many times in the past and continue to remain very important uh, bulwarks of the U.S. economy, especially as we start, as I hope we will, getting into the economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prasad. Uh, I now like to turn to Ms. Fagnani. You're recognized for five minutes. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez, Chairman Kim, Ranking Member Shabbat, Ranking Member Hearn, and distinguished members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Chris Fignani, and I'm the owner of Lynn Medical. Established in 1966, my company is a second-generation, family-owned medical products distributor 
We have 30 employees and we're located in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan. We represent over 100 medical manufacturers and we distribute nationally to hospitals, doctors, offices, and clinics. For this hearing, it's important to note a significant part of our customer base is also small businesses, uh, practices owned by the physicians themselves. I also have the pleasure of appearing before you today as the board chair of the Health Industry Distributors Association. It is the industry association that represents 100 distributor companies operating 500 distribu distribution centers across the country, providing services to virtually every provider in the country. Small business is a significant part of our industry as 73% of HIDA members are small businesses. COVID-19 created several challenges, challenges and also opportunities for Lynn Medical, both as a small business and as a distributor in the healthcare market. The main challenge we had to deal with was the significant product shortage and disruptions to the healthcare supply chain. Representing quality product is a pillar of our organization. As demand was in many cases three times the capacity from our traditional manufacturer partners, we found ourselves having to vet new sources, something we were not used to doing as we had uh, a very solid uh, stream of manufacturer partners. We were also used to operating in a very black and white uh, world. Products were either FDA approved and we distributed them or they were not FDA approved and we did not distribute them. We now had to include understanding the FDA's guidance on products approved under emergency use authorization and timely awareness of the shifting guidance from the FDA. As a small business, we do not have a legal department or a regulatory department or a very large purchasing department whose role it is to navigate through these complex issues. We found this a critical task we had to take on, uh, but very important that we navigate and very difficult to navigate through. I have two examples of how shifting EAU guidance affected Lynn Medical. The first is KN95 masks. KN95 masks were allowed under EAU due to the shortage of N95 masks in the United States. Guidance on what factories were approved to provide the KN95 masks and labeling on the packages, uh, the guidance from the FDA has shifted throughout this pandemic. We had product that had left China. When it left China, it was on the approved list and it was labeled properly. Uh, hours later, when it reached the United States, the guidance had shifted. Uh, our product was still allowable and approved, but the labeling on the box was not. So the product had to be flown back to China the boxes needed to be relabeled and then flown back to the United States. The product was already sold. We had already prepaid for the product. Uh, our customers were faced with a six week delay uh, in receiving product that was very important to them. Another example that highlights the challenges is the COVID-19 antibody test. We had shipped product that was allowable as the manufacturer had filed for an EAU and the EAU was pending based on a March 16th, 2020 FDA guidance document that deemed product allowable while EAU approval was pending. However, a subsequent FDA guidance on May 4th stated it was not allowable due to ship the product until the EAU was formally granted. It was very difficult to obtain clear answers from regulatory agencies and very difficult to explain to medical facilities while, why allowable product was now not allowable. There were significant hardships in searching for clear documentation to ensure we were compliant. Currently, we're very concerned about payables from our healthcare customers. Many facilities closed or reduced operations while at the same time had large expenditures to procure PPE that was not budgeted for. Their cash flows are not, are not at normal levels and they are asking for delayed payment plans. And with a shortage in product, we're being asked for prepayment of product. My company did apply and received approval for the paycheck a protection program. It was an easy and painly process for us and I want to thank you for including this program in the CARES Act. This assistance is critical to Lynn Medical's financial health. It allowed us to stay whole and maintain our commitment to both our employees and our customers. While the regulatory environment was confusing, we utilized the flexibility and agility small business has to become adept at vetting new suppliers and becoming a resource for our customers. We found our big, biggest success in dealing with other small businesses domestically. We partnered with small manufacturing businesses whose primary product was deemed non-essential, but wanted to keep their employees working and also assist in the COVID-19 response. Two examples, we partnered with a family-owned business in Michigan that was primarily a cut and sew shop for the automotive industry. They made seat coverings and armrests for cars. We collaborated with them so they could transition to isolation gowns and fill a critical need in the COVID-19 response. We also partnered with a drum making company in New Jersey who retooled to make face shields. 
We found in the small business community innovation, a willingness to shift priorities and take risks to keep their businesses relevant and employees working. I would like to thank the committee for its leadership on small business issues and the policies Congress has included in previous stimulus packages. As the committee considers future opportunities to support small Ms. business, I would like to your, offer your time If I can ask you just to thank wrap you. up. All right, thank you. I, I'm sorry. Um, thank you very much. We'll now turn to Mr. Billstrom. You are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Kim and Ranking Member Hearn and all of the members. Thank you for having me here today. It's an honor to testify alongside these thoughtful and passionate witnesses. I'm speaking to you this morning from North Carolina about a journey a bicycle clothing company took to respond to a national crisis and what we learned. It's an incredible story and one we never could have imagined. Our story is also remarkable because we're not an old school established apparel company in the South. In fact, we just got here. After seven years in California, we moved to Old Fort, North Carolina in October to create modern made to order clothing factory. Only one of our employees relocated from California, so nearly everyone at Kitsbo is um, a local. And for us, the COVID arrived in February. I say this with some irony because we knew the situation in China was real in February because of our supply chain. You see, we make premium clothes, very expensive, designed very carefully. We use the latest technical fabrics, and every detail is considered. We use snaps, not buttons, for example, and the best snaps in the world are made in Japan. So when our Asian suppliers of fabrics and snaps wouldn't return emails and phone calls in February, we knew it was real. So we took immediate precautions, established social distancing, we uh, cleaned doorknobs, we stopped sharing tools, and we even canceled events. By mid-March, we were considering layoffs or furloughs. But on the same day, our founder in California showed us how we could start making PPE. We elected to keep everyone and do our part to help first responders in medical. Now, the full story of how we launched into PPE would take more time than we have today. But suffice to say that on the first day, we showed the world that we were making PPE, the orders came pouring in. In fact, at the end of that first day, we had orders for more than 25,000 units. It's the biggest shift in customer demand I've seen in 40 years in business, and it happened in one day. Our, we also knew that our community needed what we could do, so we made the pivot. We're now on day 104 of making PPE, and we've shipped nearly 90,000 units in those 100 days from a cold start. We still can't make enough, and it would be months before we could sell to the public. All of our output was reserved for first responders and medical professionals. Now, there's several reasons why a small business like ours can make this pivot. First of all, we have a modern, flexible factory. We can reconfigure the sewing machines and equipment in a few hours. We do this all the time. Second, we have an awesome product team. These leaders are experts in locating suppliers, designing products, and then moving them immediately into production. Third, we had the support of other businesses in the region, supplies and suggestions. We helped each other making PPE, just as you heard a few moments ago from Lynn Medical. Fourth, and most importantly, we knew where our products would be going. I had connections in the public safety community, and we had a distribution partner. It's one thing to make PPE for the good of your community. It's another thing to get paid for it so the business can survive and so that you can pay your employees. Our distribution partner is a private foundation in our region called the Dogwood Health Trust. Dogwood is focused on the health and the wellness of 18 counties in the far western portion of North Carolina where Kitsbo is located. The team at Dogwood heard about what we were doing and made contact literally on that first day. They apparently recognized our capabilities and commitment and immediately made an order, paying for it in advance to help our cash flow. We would in, they would, in turn, share our PPE with those who needed it. Now, I want to take you back in time. This is March 21. North Carolina had its first confirmed case just two days earlier, and California had issued the stay-at-home stay order just the day before. So this was early, and it was strategic. Dogwood CEO Anthony Chang shared with me that their concern was lack of enough PPE for the region should we experience a surge. His hope was that Kitsbo would become one of several local manufacturers of PPE. It was time to act, so we did. And together we created a local supply of PPE. And for bonus points, eventually most of our supply chain was in the US. Now, as the other people testifying here today already know, a manufacturer op operation has two big knobs you can turn if you want to crank up the volume, the labor force and the raw materials. Word went out that we were looking for help, and within two days, we doubled the number of employees to over 50. We had turned up that knob, so we went for the raw material. 
Our product design team hit the phones in the internet. They worked 10 hours a day for weeks to source material. It's hard to describe the frustration after you've turned your entire workforce to making PPE, only to find out that all the elastic in the United States has been purchased in the last four days. We were competing with hundreds of other businesses. Now, after two months of work by our product team and many disappointments, we now source almost 100% of the raw materials for our PPE here in the United States. It was a very heavy lift for our small business, just as you heard about Lynn Medical. Our team came in every day for months, despite orders to shelter in place, which frankly would have been the smart thing to do. In closing, we have a couple of requests for your consideration. First, we cannot overstate how appreciative we are of the FDA and their efforts to make it easy for small businesses to sell face shields. An emergency use authorization on April 13th allows Kitspo to tell buyers that our shields are FDA authorized, that black and white that you just heard about. This is an absolute requirement for any buyer in a large organization because their internal policies require PPE to be FDA approved. Second, now we need the same thing for fabric masks. We're busy making thousands a week, but very few large organizations are allowed to buy them because of lack of FDA guidance or an emergency use authorization. Third, we agree with HIDA that a streamlined information source for small businesses would be a huge help. Small businesses rarely have even one time one full-time administrative person able to address federal requirements of compliance. Mr. Bilstrom, your Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Bilstrom. We'll now turn to Ms. Lawson. You're recognized for five minutes. Ms. Lawson, I think you may still be on mute. Sorry for that. Good morning, Congressman Hearn and other Congressman members. I'm honored to be speaking with you today. Over Arl Hudson's 40-year history, we have made the progression from distributor to custom mold part manufacturer by beginning in-house plastic injection molding in 2017. The link between that chasm was superior supply chain management and engineering design support, which is still heavily relied upon today by our OEM customers. Our primary products are molded rubber and plastic parts, extruded and formed hoses, shock and vibration, isolation products, and sealing devices. Industry served our medium heavy duty trucks, agriculture, medical, power sports, recreational marine, plumbing, and others. As an essential manufacturing company, it's been important for us to think safety first for our team members. Our leadership team took quick actions to augment our safety culture, including hospital grade cleaners, PPE, remote work, and meeting options. While we did have a few momentary concerns, we were thrilled to say we were all healthy. External supply versus demand has been a key challenge. Importing from 14 countries, over 400 containers and 92 million units annually, and exporting to 20 countries, 380 customers and 78 million units annually across the globe, brought a list of challenges from the very onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. As the Chinese New Year was being extended, customer forecast indicated inventories would be consumed soon if we did not respond with swift and creative action. Through strong relationships with our external partners and many conference calls, we were able to secure inventory availability details along with more challenging tasks and finding space on vessels, sometimes trucking to new ports in order to build faster boats, which allowed two additional weeks for production. 40% of production during March and April moved in this mode, adding 50% to our transit costs. All the while, customers were asking for daily meetings to ensure product availability. The COVID-19 reached the balance of the world just as the expedited containers began arriving to Arl Hudson. With the U.S. implementing stay-at-home orders and with many customers halting production, we needed to find a place to store the inbound inventory. We had had 18 containers lying in our parking lot with an additional 30 moved to an off-site storage. Both come with challenges and increased costs. Predicting future customer consumption required new tools for as customers had no way of predicting how they would be impacted. Our inventory dollars grew by 30%. Today, our in-transit inventory has been controlled and reduced by 50% on average. Needless to say, this has placed a strain on our manufacturing partners. The events resulted in payables being greater than receivables for a short time which was a first during my 14 years with the company. As customers reopened their doors, we were forced to change company policies to not allow for ship dates on orders to be canceled or pushed out. Our company prides itself on flexibility, so this change has been challenging 
for both our team and the customer. We have allowed the, this policy to continue, however, should the customer factory be non-operational. Our key customers provided a mountain of um, support by accepting earlier ship dates to make up for lost consumption in April. We are thankful for the true partnerships and support they have provided. Internal workforce versus demand has proven to have its own set of challenges. Late raw material arrival and Q1 forecast seeming to remain strong. Our manufacturing teams went to quick action to ensure product availability. As demand decreased due to the stay at home orders and factory closures, we kept our teams in production by building stock for products that are higher in volume but with zero firm orders. With machine utilization and our injection molding dipping to 30% in April and finished goods filling the warehouse, we did move to a four day work week during May for all team members. We were thankful that the PPP loan allowed us to avoid layoffs and furloughing our team members. In addition, although our work hours were reduced in May, we were able to pay employees for that full 40 hours of work. During flexible supply chain, due to our flexible supply chain, Arnold Hudson has been able to gain 10 new customers during the pandemic. While we have responded very well, we would like to point out that we had begun a process of diversification long before this event. Using in-house manufacturing as an example, We've been taking more production in-house. We have a new strategy to diversify our global production even more. And while it's not yet fully implemented, this crisis reveals the wisdom of the strategy. We still appreciate our internal partners and realize our international partners and realize we need them for certain components, which only frees up our expertise for items where we can excel manufacturing domestically. Just as our society is trying to learn how to better celebrate diversity and the blessings it can bring, we believe diversity to be a principle that works well for business, even supply chains. Making America stronger as a manufacturing leader will require diverse partnership with factories worldwide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lawson. And again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for joining us and, and sharing their experiences. I will begin now with the questioning uh, and recognize myself for five minutes. So uh, what we heard, and I'll, I'll start with uh, something Ms. Lawson said in her comments, that the idea that customers are, are, are asking for daily meetings uh, because there's so much uncertainty. This pandemic and the uncertainty in our supply chain has created extra costs, more uncertainty, higher risks, and certainly more frustration. Um, as we heard from Mr. Bilstrom, uh, the level of frustration uh, trying to uh, figure this out in, in, in a very difficult world. And, and Mr. Bilstrom, I'm going to quote from your submitted testimony, uh, which I thought was fascinating, the, the full story. I wish we had time to hear it all. But uh, on, on page 25, you say, Kitspo was competing with dozens, hundreds, of other manufacturers for the same key material, plastic, elastic, elastic HEPA filter media, et cetera, all of which was obviously critical and essential supplies in a worldwide disaster. This could have been recognized and the appropriate material secured by a central authority. I, I want to explore that idea. I, I've been pushing for a, a, a centralized supply chain czar, czar um, because this is so critical. We see it for our small businesses in their need to get everything from raw materials um, and, and supplies to manufacture their goods, one leading to another as, as small businesses rely on each other, which we've heard from the witnesses, uh, but also the, the fact that as we compete with each other, prices are going up and, and it's making it very difficult for, for small companies. Uh, in particular, we've seen this with um, the PPE, the personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, gowns, et, et cetera. So I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Prasad. When you're looking at essential goods like PPE, medical devices, the food supply, et cetera, uh, where do you see the federal government has fallen short in the early months of this pandemic in the spring, and what can we be doing to make sure that we don't fall short in the, in the months ahead of us? Uh, Dr. Prasad, you're still muted. Uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, your question is a very pertinent one, and as I think uh, my fellow panelists have indicated, regulatory certainty is certainly one of the most critical aspects that uh, small businesses seem to be contending with. Um, certainly, there are um, uh, facts um, changing on the ground uh, by. I think we lost the signal again, Dr. Prasad. You may be muted. 
Sorry, um, I think the, I was emphasizing the issue of regulatory certainty to make the point that uh, um, the experiences of my fellow panelists suggest that while the FDA um, and other regulatory agencies have been flexible, which is certainly a very welcome, the lack of certainty is generally challenging for them. And that, I think, needs to be a, a critical element that, uh, um, uh, that the government can help with in addition uh, to providing more for such programs. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prasad. And uh, let me turn to um, Mr. Bilstrom, because uh, as I, I quoted you, how would you see a, a centralized authority for supply chain possibly making a difference uh, in the work you were trying to do, as you touched on getting the raw, raw materials and ultimately getting finished product to your customers? You know, I, I, I hate to say this, but I don't know. Um, that's not my area of expertise. So I can explain the need, which is, um, as scarce materials that are essential and can't be replaced any other way um, are identified, we need some way of organizing it. But I don't have a specific proposal on No, and, and I appreciate you uh, not waiting in where, where you didn't feel confident. One of the things I think, and, and just from my experience in business, is that uh, to the extent we can have a centralized authority who understands where there are opportunities, uh, as you touched on in your company, Kitspo, uh, did a, a, a pivot and then uh, you mentioned in your uh, testimony a pivot within a pivot in a very short period of time, helping coordinate that in the centralized authority, understanding what's happening, the needs across the nation, the resources across the nation, and trying to match those, I think, is a good opportunity. Uh, but I, I've ex used uh, my time. Uh, I'll now turn to uh, my colleague, Mr. Hearn, to ask his, in question, his questions. Thank you, Mr. Schneider. I really appreciate it. Again, thanks for all the testimony that we just heard regarding supply chain. Uh, Ms. Lawson, you know, I've had an opportunity to tour your manufacturing, and can you tell us more about how doing in-house productions is fair compared to working with outside manufacturing partners or outsourcing? Sure. Um, as we insource, we had our own set of challenges as we began to pulling in um, from out from outside. We found that you know they had secondary operations, and we needed to learn to do pulling that. Um, eject a part out of the machine out of the secondary operations, and we were able to control that um, because um, the quality of the much better um, because as it came out, there were no additional trimming operations and such, which can um, create um, gouges and leak paths and those type of things. So, um, controlling that has been has been great. However, we um, we do believe that um, there are um, sectors um, where we will need to be the most useful location um, for the means of production because there are some items that are better suited um, and to be produced elsewhere so that it frees our expertise for items that we can excel manufacturing domestically. So um, we see it both ways. We do, and our customers do appreciate the additional control as we bring product in house. I've got a, a series of questions. One question I'll ask for all of you all, and I'll start with you. It's really, there's been a lot talked about uh, across multiple industries, pharmaceuticals, uh, PPE, and others that relate to uh, bringing things in from Asia, and more specifically China and Taiwan and things like that. What, what do you see as being a pioneer in with the Asian uh, community in, in importing and exporting to them as well? Uh, what do you see changing right now among the, uh, the perception of the American people, uh, even if we talk by American, how practical is that to bring uh, what some would like 100 percent of all uh, sourcing back to the United States, or certainly to North America? Arl Hudson, we have more than um, 5,000 part numbers, which we um, procure abroad and in the Asian um, factories. And to bring all of those back, um, the dollar for tooling, even if you're moving the tools, in some cases you can build new ones for the same cost as um, the other ones. There is testing. Um, everyone wants to have product that has good quality, which requires testing. So um, the cost associated with that would um, really be unbelievable. 
for us, um, new products and where it makes sense to move move them for critical parts, we support that and um, believe that it um, and sourcing parts will be great. But there is a place for products um, to be left where they are. And we do see concern from our manufacturing partners that we've worked with and you know they want um, as businessmen, businessmen themselves and women, they want um, to provide good quality service to us. So um, it is a, a bit of a strain on relationships and we want to make sure that we're able to provide product as promised to customers throughout the U.S. Thank you. Uh, Professor Prasad, just from a policy standpoint, when you're looking at what you're seeing the movement across the United States uh, because of the pandemic, this uh, bringing back, this acceleration of bringing back manufacturing from specifically China uh, back to North America yesterday was the first day of the USMCA deal. How, how do you see uh, that opportunity, that uh, confluence of opportunity from China to now USMCA with free trade? lower labor costs in Mexico, how that would uh, uh, soften the blow of uh, price increases or product uh, price increases that might affect the, the, the willingness to buy. Now, certainly the um, onshoring and also the regionalization of supply chains as opposed to using global supply chains is going to have some positive benefits in the short run in terms of employment in the U.S. and in the North American continent, but I think for small businesses, there are some real constraints uh, imposed by that because the very linear yeah. um, supply chains are set in place, many of which going through Asia, as was the case for Hudson Manufacturing, has led to enormous gains in efficiency and frankly has allowed them to create uh, certain product structures that might not be possible if you had much more onshore or regionalized supply chains. So I think it's going to be a trade-off for every small business. There are huge benefits to be gained from much broader supply chains, um, especially if you think about the sort of diversification um, um, that the uh, lady from Hudson Manufacturing talked about. Um, uh, and that has to be offset against the fact that there are going to be job gains, certainly, if you have more onshoring. But from a longer term perspective, I think the um, broader diversification of the supply chain is certainly going to be better for small businesses. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hearn, and I uh, would now like to recognize uh, the gentleman from Ohio, uh, the ranking member of the Small Business Committee, Steve Shabbat. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I understand that my connection may have some challenges here, so hopefully uh, you can hear me okay. If not, let me know. Um, I'll, t I'll start with uh, uh, Ms. Lawson, if I can. I want to thank all the witnesses for being with us uh, today. Um, you alluded to this in your uh, testimony, but uh, could you describe in a little greater detail some of the uh, more significant trade-offs uh, that your company had to navigate uh, in order to keep your supply chain intact? And uh, do you think these trade-offs could result in any uh, long-term uh, uh, damages or challenges or disadvantages uh, for, for, your, uh, for your company? Sure. Some of the biggest challenges we are going to face as we go forward is that we have really strained our manufacturing partners. One of the keys to our success is making sure that we're an important customer to our to our partners. So we want to make sure that we're in that top one, two, three on their customer list. So we are a big percentage of their business. So we have some manufacturing partners who are only manufacturing two or maybe three days a week at this time. So as business um, begins to increase, we're going to face challenges um, for those products that must come from them because everything that we purchase is a one-to-one -one relationship between the customer. There is nothing that um, we can sell to another to another customer or nor can it be produced by anyone else without additional tooling being built. So we're going to need to support these factories as they begin bringing up their production, maybe in some cases rehiring on their own um, and building back up their timelines to be able to manufacture. So it's going to be a big challenge. Um, I also said in my statement, we're looking to diversify and we've already began through that process. We went through 101 different manufacturing companies. Um, we've narrowed it down to 
almost 30 and um, due to the pandemic, we're a little bit strained opening up new factories as we cannot put boots on the ground to make sure that we do those full scope audits to ensure the qualities are in place that our products require. Okay. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll, I'll stick with this Lawson at this point. Um, what would you say was your greatest asset in weathering uh, the disruptions in your uh, and COVID-19? And what would you say was your, your challenge? Okay. Our, um, I would say that we have built very strong relationships and we communicate very well with our, with our supply chain all the way um, from the supply chain being the our factories and also being our customers. So communication has been key and being very open with what we're being faced with. So we've had conference calls after conference calls, um, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night, followed by 7 a.m. conference calls with other countries in the morning. Um, but it's very um, important that we're communicating and that everyone knows um, what is the situation. And it, um, that includes our freight forwarding teams. Um, on the other side, um, the biggest challenge has really for us been um, you know, where will we place this inventory? And our payables have also, I um, forgot which one of my colleagues talked about um, payables, but it is a strain because as many, we've seen some customers close their doors um, throughout this process. And um, that's concerning with our payables. And for the first time we had our um, receivables less than our payables. And that, it, it was a strain and a concern but I'm very thankful that our team members who have had long-term um, stability with our customers have allowed, with our factories have been able to move from one um, side of our business to the other. So we've been fluid and being able to keep our head count where it needs to be and manage our expenses accordingly. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, on my screen, the time clock is frozen, so I have no idea how, how much time I have left. Could could somebody educate me on that? You have 30 seconds. Okay. All right. Well, at this point, probably not having uh, uh, sufficient time to really get into the, uh, uh, you know, another question, have the uh, answers be fair to my colleagues. Uh, um, I'll yield back in a second. But I just once again uh, want to thank all the witnesses for their uh, testimony today. I think it's been very helpful. Supply chain is uh, absolutely critical and uh, during these times, uh, you know, a, a clear challenge and uh, it was helpful to hear how you all are dealing with it and recommendations that we can uh, work as we're moving forward for potential legislation or other things that we're involved in. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shabbat. And we will uh, have a chance to go to the second round of questions if, if you want to stay on. Uh, but the gentleman's time has expired and yields back. Uh, I'd now like to recognize um, uh, the gentleman from Minnesota, uh, Mr. Stauber. He, Mr. Stauber is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Contracting and Infrastructure. He's now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the witnesses uh, <clears throat> for being here. Uh, you know, since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis, we have seen over 70 countries impose some sort of export restrictions on an array of different products, including med <clears throat> excuse me, medical supplies, pharmaceuticals, and food products. Can any of the witnesses tell me what would happen if tomorrow the communist country of China chose to implement an export ban on active pharmaceutical ingredients, medicines, and critical minerals that power our renewable energy? Anybody? Well, I can tell you, I can tell you what would happen. We'd be in deep trouble. You know, currently the United States relies on communist China and other foreign actors who do not have our best interests in mind for too many of our goods and services. China, for example, is one of the top producers of API active pharmaceutical ingredients, which are the basic components of antibiotics and other prescription drugs. And because of their poor environmental and labor standards, China manufactures and exports many of the minerals critical to our national security. The Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo exports about 60%, 60% of the world's cobalt supplies, 
Cobalt is used in batteries, computers, and yes, renewable energies. According to Amnesty International, this cobalt is mined by children in appalling conditions. These kids don't go to school. They don't get any protective equipment. They don't have a minimum wage or a limit on the hours worked. These kids mine cobalt for our renewable energy and our cell phones and our technology. Most of the United States estimated 1 million tons of cobalt reserve are in my district and could be safely and responsibly mined with strong environmental standards and union protected jobs. You know, during this pandemic, it has become apparent more than ever, we must improve our domestic supply chain. We can no longer rely on our, on our adversaries like the Congo, Russia, and China for resources that are critical to our economy, our national security, and our health. For these reasons, I recently introduced two pieces of legislation to bolster self-reliance on our own supply chain. First, I introduced Securing America's Critical Mineral Supply Chain Act, a bill that would incentivize manufacturers to purchase domestic minerals like those mined in northeastern Minnesota. And second, I introduced the Securing America's Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Act, a bill that would require our federal agencies to purchase drugs made in the United States and by incentivizing investments into America's supply chain, I am confident we can become a more self-reliant and resilient nation. We have the opportunity. We now know the deficiencies in our Supply Chain Act. And I will state this to you all. The state of Minnesota is ready to help our nation with its supply chain issues. We can supply the critical minerals for our national defense, our national security, to build our pharmaceutical uh, instruments, to build ventilators, and we must take this opportunity and not falter. The supply chain is broken, we've relied, and we cannot rely any longer on nations that do not have our best interest at hand. The state of Minnesota played a big role in World War II with mining the iron ore that built, makes our steel, built our, built our tanks, our ships, our airplanes, our weapons. And northern Minnesota stands ready to secure our supply chain, both pharmaceuticals, and our critical minerals, and I yield back. Uh, th thank you so much. Um, with that, that wraps up our first round of questioning. I would like to go to a, a second round, uh, if that's okay with the witnesses, and I'll, I'll start by recognizing myself for, for five minutes. Um, and, and I want to turn to uh, Ms. Fagnani, uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing your, your name right. I have a feeling I'm close, but not quite, quite on. Uh, but you, de you described uh, in your written testimony some of the, the challenges you faced, but also shared some ideas. Uh, one of them was streamlined information source for small businesses. Um, having had my own small business uh, in, a, in a prior career uh, before coming to Congress, I know how important information is and how hard it is for small companies to um, uh, get that information, especially because because the, oftentimes there is not a, a a dedicated resource, whether it's for compliance or, or for uh, human human resources, et cetera. People wear, wear many, many different hats. Um, and I also know that uh, through the first few months of, of this pandemic, uh, from the SBA, from Treasury, there's been um, uh, starts, fits and starts, uh, changes in direction, whether it's uh, applications for the IDL program or uh, guidance on, on the forgiveness uh, process for the, the PPP. So my, my question to you is, uh, how important is that clear and simple communication, and what would be the impact of streamlining that communication and, and reducing the complexity for small businesses? Yeah, well, well, thank you for the question. It's critical. 
um, we're selling uh, medical uh, supplies, medical equipment that are either going to protect our frontline workers or be used on, on patients. And it's critical that we understand what the uh, FDA's guidance is. Uh, I mentioned in, in our old world, it was very black and white. Things were FDA approved. They went through long, laborious processes. But in an effort to get uh, more product available, the FDA did enact uh, emergency authorization use for many products. So our ability to understand guidance, guidance changing um, so that we're buying correctly um, is, is critical, that we're not distributing product that we should not be distributing. And then the other complication in it was just explaining to our medical customers why guidance had changed and why perhaps the product uh, that they had bought can no longer be bought or um, you know, just why things were changing. There was a lot of uh, information about um, uh, you know, bad product being distributed and so a lot of um, skepticism as there, sh as there should have been. And um, just it was critical to us to make sure that we were uh, supplying the, co the right product and we were able to communicate accurately with our customers. So the uh, FDA website is a, is a tremendous resource, but it is uh, difficult to navigate through uh, and it became very cumbersome. So streamlining that for small business, um, some, some type of alert letting us know that there has been a change in guidance so that we know to look would be helpful. But, uh, but that would that would really be critical for right. us at this point. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. I want to I shift gears and turn to Dr. Prasad um, for a moment. Uh, in, in your testimony, uh, you talked about things that the government could do, uh, you know, from uh, developing consistently enforced domestic regulatory policies uh, to providing greater certainty with our, our uh, trade relationships around the world, including de-escalating trade wars, uh, your, your words. Um, but you also talked about um, the advantages of bilateral versus, uh, uh, advantages of multilateral versus bilateral approaches uh, to our trading partners. I, I, I would ask you to expand on that a little bit. So one issue is um, first, um, uh, access to export markets in other countries, and second, um, access to reliable sources of uh, intermediate goods uh, uh, inputs and so on. Uh, now as the, um, uh, previous uh, congressman um, uh, uh, who made a statement about China pointed out um, one needs consistent standards uh, and the ability to rely on trading partners around the world. Um, and bilateral trading um, relationships do create uh, complications in particular for small businesses because they create an array of different types um, of regulations that small businesses have to contend with as they look to diversify. For instance, Ms. Lawson spoke about trying to diversify her um, uh, suppliers and sources across uh, uh, a number of countries. And that becomes difficult if you're dealing with uh, individual trading partners and their own requirements um, and the provisions of an individual trade deal. So if you think about something like a, the, the trans-specific partnership that the U.S. stepped back from, um, the other 11 countries went ahead and what they did was institute a common set of regulations, a common set of labor, environmental and other standards that now all those countries can use and they become benchmarks for further trading relationships. So these sorts of multilateral approaches I think would be good uh, to deal with the uh, trading partners of the U.S. and could also be used to bring on board countries like China because then they would be forced as well uh, to take on board those standards that the U.S. has negotiated with many of its trading partners. And frankly, many countries around the world have concerns about China's economic and trading practices. And rather than going it alone, I think if the U.S. joined forces with other trading partners, it would certainly get a lot more out of China than we've seen so far. Great. Thank you. And my time has expired. Uh, I'd like to turn now to uh, the ranking me member, Mr. Hearn, uh, for five minutes, if he'd like. Thank you. Uh, Professor, let's just continue on with that thought since we're on, on this, uh, this train of thought. Um, when you talk about uh, a standardized approach, um, Obviously, for the last 20 years, certainly since 2001 and in, in China's introduction into the World Trade Organization, uh, some would argue there have been books written on it, maybe you've written books on it, I'm not sure. Um, I would love to read them if you have, about China's uh, just methodical move through uh, tackling and taking over uh, columns of industry uh, to be able to uh, uh, take over that supply chain with low cost, uh, very broad uh, acceptance across the world. I want to I want to go back to the onshore piece of this as well. You, you mentioned that I guess on the margin that it would be very difficult 
to for businesses to realize the same uh, uh, cost of goods uh, cost, if you will, as they would with China, and probably the breadth of the source as well. But don't you see that as a possibility as, as we're all looking at USMCA and what it can bring? Uh, most people don't realize that China or uh, Mexico is our largest trading partner, second to Canada, uh, comes Canada, and then third, China. And with again, with the push for buy USA, buy North America, whatever, that we're going to see some of these uh, more easily stood up industries come to Mexico so that more of the Western Hemisphere can enjoy those without the political, the geopolitical constraints that's going to come of what China's trying to do. Congressman Hearn, I think you have a, a legitimate point, and one could think about um, re-onshoring as part of the diversification process. Certainly, one doesn't want to leave American manufacturers either small or large vulnerable uh, to geopolitical tensions um, uh, and leave them vulnerable to single sources and suppliers that could be disrupted either by bilateral tensions or uh, by conflicts that those countries might be uh, engaged in um, that create disruptions within their own economies. Um, so certainly it could be an effective part of onshoring, but I think one has to think about the other aspect as well. Um, while we try to move jobs back to the U.S., one also needs to recognize that small businesses um, are, um, are very important exporters as well. Um, so I think a far better solution might be to think about how in addition um, to using onshoring as a diversification strategy, um, one tries to level the playing field in terms of trading relationships with all of our trading partners so that small businesses have diversified sources of production, but also diversified export markets, which I think are equally important. And I guess to piggyback off of that too, since we're on the policy conversation, that most of this is driven by, uh, again, openness to markets, ability to grow uh, your small business on the export side, but on the import side, it's to drive down cost. Uh, we're a free enterprise uh, society that we're looking and seeking for low cost providers as well as uh, to Mr. Bilson's conversation earlier, just being able to find the product uh, or sourcing that from Asian continents. And what uh, China has done to deflect a lot of geopolitical issues is to disperse uh, uh, manufacturing across some of their uh, their allies in the Asian continent. And you know, Mr. Chairman, I think we could spend, uh, probably, I, I encourage Mr. Prasad to, to write a book. If you have one, I'd love to read it about this whole concept, because I think all of us here, we heard uh, Ms. Fagnani talk about what happened with the, uh, the discrepancy between the appropriate uh, labeling of boxes of the, the KN95 mask and other PPE that had to go back in delays. And I think, you know, when we have these geopolitical problems, uh, as we know, we're talking about supply chain here, but there are other columns of air that stands up here from military uh, intellectual property issues uh, the vast uh, reverse engineering of our products, all these things are, are paramount for us to all understand and get our arms around. And uh, I just want to again thank the witnesses for being experts in your areas and sharing with us your thoughts. Uh, this will go a long ways to formulating our policies as we go forward. Uh, it's great to hear people uh, that deal directly with these supply chains and also use them as an export market in many cases. Uh, I, I, I think as I said yesterday in a small business committee hearing, that we all need to learn from this pandemic, put together a pandemic playbook, and, and as, it, as it just one column again of uh, thought was with the auto loans, is to capture all these different uh, communications breakdowns, these, these issues with labeling, all these things we can put into a nice book and be able to step away into legislation or to have uh, hopefully, all of us will never have to experience another pandemic, but our country will, and that we have the playbook on the shelf to do things differently and better so that we don't have disruptions like we did this time. Thank each of you for being on this call. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hearn, and I couldn't agree more. May we never experience anything like this again. Um, before I wrap up, I would like to ask unanimous consent to submit to the record a letter from 14 associations, including the AICPA, the National Retail Federation, and others, calling for the Fed to create a short-term lending facility to help companies bridge supply chain disruptions. Uh, with, uh, without hearing objection, so ordered. Um, 
Thank you, and, and, and let me now take a moment to close. And, and in closing, I want to thank our witnesses. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your experiences, your perspectives, your insights. Um, uh, I know uh, there were more members who would have liked to have joined us today. Unfortunately for many, it's a travel day. We've been in session this week, and many are traveling back to their home districts. Uh, but uh, I, I can assure you they will uh, follow the testimony. Uh, I appreciate everything you said uh, for all that you've done. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, global supply chains were built to be linear and efficient, maximizing profits but leaving us vulnerable to disruptions. The pandemic has made clear the need to build a more resilient supply chain because we know future disruptions will occur. We heard today from experts and entrepreneurs that took the initiative early on to make their supply chains more resilient and establish some best practices we can employ at the federal level as we move forward. I hope this is a wake-up call to our business community and our federal policymakers to support policy that allows small businesses to survive and bounce back after a large-scale disruption like the COVID-19 pandemic. Doing so will allow our nation's small businesses to successfully confront unforeseen circumstances and will be critical to building a strong domestic economy. I ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record and without objections so ordered. And if there is no further business before this committee, I ask everyone to stay safe, stay healthy, I ask our small businesses to stay nimble, and this meeting is adjourned.